Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Northwest Pinball and Arcade Show. This panel is entitled Collecting 101, and we are all local collectors of pinball and arcade games. And we're going to talk a little bit about what got in, us into collecting, what it's like collecting, and then really open just the floor to you all to see if you have questions or want to talk about collecting or buying your first game. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dan Halligan. I do the promotions and sponsorship stuff for the show. I have a pinball and arcade collecting problem. I have been collecting games for over 20 years and probably have 12 pinball machines and 10 arcade games um, and have owned over 200 games in the last 20 years. Um, anyone else want to introduce themselves? Uh, hi, my name is Chris Force. I we're talking about our collecting habit, how we got into it. Yep. Okay. Um, I have. Is been, this where you blame me? This is where I blame you. Um, I got into the hobby seven years ago after attending a collecting 101 panel with Dan and some of the other pro, um, principals of the show, and mostly what they had to say was volunteer at the show. So I did, and have been volunteering at the show ever since 2014. And then shortly after I did that, 2016, Dan helped me buy my first game. And it's here at the show. So I've been collecting for six years. I have seven pinball machines and a, and, um, a multi-board cocktail. And I think that probably makes me the junior collector here. I think it does, unfortunately. For sure. <laughs> and I also have something of a collecting problem. I started a nonprofit. It's called the Northwest Pinball Collective. It's in North Seattle. And the intention is, hey, what if we had this year round in one spot? And no joke, one of the dangers of this hobby is running out of space and running out of um, political capital with your spouse. So when I had this idea, she said, you should call it the Get This Crap Out of My Garage Project. And most of the wives that I talk to think that that is an amazing name. And most of the uh, gentlemen are like, you should never do that. <laughs> Sandy? Well, I um, feel like I'm in the minority here um, as one of the spouses that's not saying, get that junk out of my garage. Um, I... I'm Sandy Lasanti. I work with the medic group here um, in the center console. I manage the keys, and I'm also responsible for bringing um, all the games off the trucks into the show floor. So we, we do that um, earlier um, before people actually get, get in to see the games. Um, I have been collecting with my husband since ooh, 2011, I think. Um, we have a very strict limit on the number of pinballs that are allowed in our house because we are at a finite amount of space. Um, and I don't want to buy a bigger house. Um, I would rather limit our collection. So we're constantly looking for friends that have easy access homes to park our games in. Uh, <laughs> so that's another way, um, other than just expanding your garage or um, starting a a nonprofit where people can bring their games to help out. Um, we have six pinball machines in our basement, and we have a May Arcade, which was actually the first thing that we um, that we did. Um, my husband put a server in the bottom of a, an old cabinet, and it now runs. I don't even know how many thousands of games um, on that on that arcade. It's not a very um, flashy one, but it was the first thing that we did that went that made us think, oh, we can do this in our house instead of having to go to arcades to play all this stuff. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Lorraine. I'm the president of the board of directors for the show. And first of all, I just want to thank all of you for coming here to listen to us today and coming to the show in general. It means a lot to see so many people here. We're a community-driven nonprofit show, and thank you so much for supporting us. Uh, I got into pinball in 2007, but I have to tell a little story because I'm sitting next to this guy who's got this Pac-Man suit. And it makes me think about when I was a kid and I first saw Pac-Man in a little town in Sela, Washington at the 7-Eleven, I was, the world changed for me because before then it had been space shooter arcade games and then I walk in and there's this yellow thing eating dots with this waka waka sound and these ghosts and I, it was the coolest thing ever. It was so cool. My mom would give me a dollar for lunch every day at school and I stopped eating lunch to save my dollar so I could go play four games of Pac-Man after school. And I felt really guilty because I was basically lying to my mom saying that I was eating lunch. And that lasted about a week after that. I, I felt too guilty. So I, I stopped playing Pac-Man with my lunch money. But it's just cool to look at your Pac-Man suit, Dan, and think about <laughs> you know, what that game means to me. And uh, I never imagined a Pac-Man suit at the time. And it's just the coolest thing ever. So, uh, But back in those days, the thought of having an arcade game in your home or a pinball machine in your home was, to me, just kind of unfathomable. I mean, it was just the impossible. They existed in arcades, you played them in arcades, and then when you were at home, you dreamed about being able to go back to arcades and play them again. That, at least, was me. So, in 2007, I discovered a pinball machine in just a, a small kind of, a, kind of place, and... I then bought a book about pinball machines, and I started reading about all these machines, and it had pictures of every game. And then, for some reason, I started thinking, maybe I could get one. Maybe it was possible. And so I started doing some reading up on that, and I ended up buying one that we've not had our show. It's a Zizzle Pirates of the Caribbean, <laughs> because it was very affordable. It was about $70 at Best Buy. There's a reason for that. <laughs> Not so easy, is it, Métis? So I got that, and it was a nice, easy one to get in our condo. And I remember telling my wife, clear as day, I said, you know, this is great. I finally have a pinball machine, and this is good. I am happy. This is, satisfies my need. Well, now I have like 10 of them, and I have too many. So it is a funny thing that when you get your first, uh, it's kind of hard to stop. But uh, I, will, I will keep it short to that as kind of an introduction to myself. When we get into question and answers, I do want to stress, if you have a question, please walk over to the microphone over there, because this is being live streamed. And if you don't talk into the mic, the people all listening can't hear your questions. So when we get to that, please do. So, Dan, uh, do you have some other things we want to go through for agenda? Yeah. Um, what do you all wish was a piece of advice someone gave you before you bought your first game? <laughs> <laughs> What's that look? Wow. That's hard. That's a hard question. Piece of advice? Um... I did get this advice, and it was wonderful. And it was, if you're just getting into the hobby, make friends with somebody that knows what they're doing and has a truck and a hand truck, and have them go with you. And like I said, Dan helped me buy my first game, and I had no idea what I was doing, but he did. That's great advice, actually. So mine would be buy a working game. Uh, I started collecting by buying project games and knew nothing about electronics or how to do repair. If you buy a working game, you're still going to encounter those problems. But it's nice to have a game that you can play uh, at the beginning. You know what I would say is one of the greatest things about pinball collecting for me is that I got really comfortable with solving mechanical problems. Now, I can't do circuit board work, and I've made some wonderful friends that can help me when I have problems like that. But pinball has turned me into a person that when something else in my house doesn't work, I'm not afraid to open it up anymore and take a look. And I have so many great tools, because in pinball you collect tools. So I feel like it's made me a better problem solver when it comes to just not being afraid to open something up and just try to figure out how it works. So that's 
probably one of the best things I learned and I would give advice to all of you if you're thinking about doing this. It can help you in more ways than you realize. I think those are all really good pieces of advice. I think the one thing that I would add to that is, um, especially now with how expensive pinball machines are getting, um, I would say think about your list. What do you want? Um, because if you're doing things like just grabbing that first game that's available um, without really thinking it through, sometimes you can end up with a problem that you can't fix or you're not interested in fixing, and it's much more difficult to unload a game that's not working um, than it is to have one that's working that you're excited about um, and that you want to have in your home and play for a little while. What is the weirdest, coolest, or grossest thing you've found in a game? I found Italian Lyra. Ah. I found quite a few mouse nests. Uh, but I bought one, I bought a, a vector Atari arcade game off of eBay maybe like 10, 12 years ago. And I went to pick it up, and it was at a like pawn shop up near like Port Orchard or something. And the guy helped me load it in my truck. And as we loaded it in my truck, I heard ka ching of a ton of money. And he goes, I probably should have opened this game up before I auctioned it. Maybe we should open it up now. And I'm like, no, no, nope, thanks. I uh, loaded it up. I drove 10 blocks, opened it up. And there was almost $100 of 1982 quarters in it, which was killer. I think along the lines of what you have, we have two games that came over on container ships. And um, the, the door of our Adams family still has Deutschmark coin slots. Um, and I think that's super cool. Yeah, I still have Lyra on, that, on my coin door for the same reason. I have never found anything interesting in the bottom of a pinball machine except some loose screws. Gross. Nothing gross. I just, I guess I've, the ones I've had, I just haven't been that adventurous in their history. I think when I started collecting, I was, it was probably pre-internet or early internet, but I was waiting usually for the little nickel to come out and looking for the ads there. So I was driving up to small towns and buying games out of people's like barns and sheds. So there was a lot of animal feces. I've heard stories, like bad stories, just today even about someone picking up a bunch of games and they had termites in them. So you do have to kind of keep an eye on, on what you're picking up. Or you could be lucky like Dan and score a centipede for free off of buy nothing. Yes, that did happen. <laughs> Um, Got to be quick on your buy nothing. It took you what, like 20 minutes to get it running? Yeah. It was just a fuse. That's the, if you don't know, that's the one thing that people always say in ads or joke about. The machine's not working. It's probably just a fuse. Occasionally it actually is. Usually not, though. Uh, where do you all buy games? What are your top resources? Uh, I'll, I'll start. I've purchased games from friends. I've purchased games from just people I've met through um, pinball groups. Uh, I have purchased games new from Stern or distributors. So I've gotten from a variety of places. And then I did get one at Best Buy, <laughs> a Zizzle. <laughs> I don't have a Zizzle, but all the resources you're talking about, that's the same thing that we do. I've bought eight. Uh, I got two of them off of Craigslist. Um, and the others, I think, are all container games. And what I mean by container games, uh, Sandy referred to this, and the, the Deutschmark and the Lira. There's a guy in Italy that collects games, puts them out on a spreadsheet, sends it out every so often. And there's a group here in town that has imported quite a few of them. And we would put together a list, get. 25, 30 people games, he'd put them in a container and ship them back across the Atlantic. Um, 
This is a little crazy right now. Shipping doesn't work so well, so I don't think that's really viable at the moment, but I think a lot of us are also excited for it to come back. I think the one thing that I would add to that is um, that is where you're going to see pictures. You don't really know what that game is going to look like when you get it or whether or not it's going to be working. Um, so you need to be really comfortable or have a good network of people that can help you before you dive into a big project like that. Yeah, the network, the community, that's, that's really important because you're going to come across stuff you don't know how to deal with. But especially if you're, you know, you're hooked in around here, you're going to know people that know it. Well, yeah, the first step when you get a shipping container game is you have to convert the power uh, to work here. And it can be a little confusing, especially with some not easy to convert older machines or smaller manufacturer ones. It's not that bad. <laughs> and then there's like wires connecting all the fuses. There's burnout con connectors with the wires soldered directly to the pins on the board. I, I love those kind of games, but I would not ever think someone should get that in their first couple years of collecting unless they really want to learn how to repair a pinball machine from the bottom up. And you have to strip them completely down and clean out 25 years of gunk. Yeah. Well, that goes right with your advice of buy a working game. Buy a known quantity. But a lot of those games are actually working. They're just totally rigged up weird. Yeah, well, they have problems, yeah. but they power up and you yeah. can start a game. <laughs> Let's stop scaring the folks. <laughs> They're leaving. <laughs> um, where do you buy parts for games? What are your top places that you uh, use? Uh, for parts, well, there's like Pinball Life. There's Marco Specialties. They're out in the show. Um, gosh. Um, I think that those are the places I have my main account. Uh, I, a few others escape me. I'm sure you guys can. Boards from yeah. Victor Tan. <laughs> Speaking of networks. Um, for arcade stuff, arcade shop's pretty much the number one place. But I find like when you're looking for uh, game-specific parts, you kind of have to widen your search um, to like CPR for reproduction play fields. Different companies put out back glasses for them. Different companies have the plastic kits for them. Um, sometimes reading the forums on pin side that are specific to that game, you'll find the one part that always breaks someone has just on their own made that part and they make 20 of them that you can buy one and hopefully get it before it sells out. And there you have good recommendations on like the little protectors, like the little cliffies and things like that that protect those bits that, um, that break more frequently but um, that don't come stock in the game. Yeah, I'm pretty much Pinball Life and Marco. Um, I did find a full set of figurines for Lord of the Rings on Pinside. There's a guy that like collects these things and puts them together in packages. It was pretty cool. He hadn't sold one for a long time, and I messaged him. It took him two weeks to get back to me. He's like, oh, I don't really do that anymore, but I've got some lying around. I'll sell you some. What game do you have in your collection that you would never sell? I was just talking about Lord of the Rings, and my daughter has forbidden me from ever selling it. And I wouldn't want to. And she doesn't play it, so I'm not sure why she gets a say. But yeah, Lord of the Rings is the one. Not your F-14? I don't want to sell F-14, but for, you know, Family Isle Harmony... They none of them would mind seeing F14 go. That that one's my baby. Lord of the Rings is the family game. I don't want to sell any of my games. <laughs> do, do you ever sell any of your games, or um, do you just slowly add? We haven't we haven't sold any. Um, um, I think so. We got our first game, and I said to my husband, okay, just, just the one, and then thought about it for like 
two seconds and went, unless we find an atoms in a really good condition. And so I think it'd be pretty hard pressed to get rid of our atoms family um, since it was um, like my slippery slope sliding game. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I might be willing to part with the Metallica that we have, but um, I don't want to say that out loud because my husband's in the audience. <laughs> He's staring at you intently. He's totally <laughs> glaring right now. <laughs> it's interesting. I think Adam's Family is my one game that I wouldn't sell. And it just, growing up when I remember that that movie, and I just loved the movie with Angelica Houston and, um, and Raj Julia. Um, and it's. Voice. The voice, it, they got so many of the samples of all of them, which they don't always get for a game. And it's funny, it looks cool, it sounds great, and it has a big nostalgia factor for me. And they made a lot of them, but now it's still a pretty rare and sought after game. I was talking to Todd, and he operates pinball machines uh, just right before coming in here, and he said his Adams family consistently out on location does just as well as most of his new games um, because it's still so popular with people. I feel like if I sold it, I could never find one again for a decent price. I would say for absolute sure, my Williams Indiana Jones will stay with me forever because I feel very... Uh, lucky to have that game, especially now because it's it's hard to find. And uh, along the lines of what they said, uh, I love the the older '90s games when they would do movie themes. They would usually get the actors that were in the movies to do custom voice callouts for the games. And in the Williams Indiana Jones, the actor who plays Sala does a bunch of great jackpot yells and all kinds of good stuff. And games today, they it's harder for them to get. The, the you know the actors from movies to actual voice the games they'll use a sound alike and uh, but my Williams Indiana Jones is just a wonderful game it's got a ton of modes uh, I love the movies so that is my keeper. How many of you still own the first game you bought? You both do, right? Do you still own the Zizzle? <laughs> I do. <laughs> do you still own the first real game you bought? Uh, so when I got into collecting, I got four games at once. I got a brand new Family Guy. I got a Fun House. I got a, an Elvis. And what was the other one? Um, Escape. Oh, Haunted House. And uh, it's a great question because they're all gone. Sometimes after a while, a game just... I, I say when you, go get a, when you go through a pinball collecting stage and you get a game, there's the enjoyment of when you first have it and then there's the enjoyment of years of going by of having it and sometimes that enjoyment stays and sometimes you start to just feel like you know I've, I've kind of just experienced this game to its full potential and I'd love to get something else so apparently not everyone has that feeling <laughs> well f14 for me takes me back to high school uh, and I was having a rough time, and I could always go to Village Lanes and drop a quarter in this machine and not have to worry about anything. Um, and for the first time ever, I have for sale signs on machines at the show. Like, okay, like, like Mike was talking about. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I need to keep this one. I feel like I've, I've had my time with it, and someone else might get more out of it than I would. Uh, but, yeah. I'm not letting go of F14 anytime soon, but I did sell. My second purchase was two games at once: Lord of the Rings, Doctor Who, and I don't have Doctor Who anymore. You learn about yourself a lot through collecting. You learn about kind of how you tick. And after a number of times of getting a pinball machine and me proudly saying to my wife or my kids, "This game is great. I will never sell it." I love it. It's so awesome. And then now it's gone. So I've learned about myself that I'm not going to make that claim anymore because I've realized that as the years go on, sometimes your tastes change or you just decide you'd like to get something else. So it, that's a great thing about getting in this. I think you do learn a lot about yourself. 
So I think I got into collecting a little different than you all because I just didn't realize you could own games. And I went to a party at this like skater dude's house and they had like three arcade games in their kitchen. And I was like, wow, I didn't know you could own these. And I like just bought whatever piece of crap arcade game I found for sale the next week, which was Vigilante where you fight to save Madonna. It's just like a scrolling fighter game that she's been kidnapped. And it's, it was totally terrible. But I bought a bunch of really cheap games and slowly like fixed them up, sold them, bought nicer games. It took me a while to buy like a game that I really sought after. And that was Black Knight. And that was like the first pinball machine I got into because I used to go to this place out by Bellevue called Triple Alliance, and I'd buy my D&D &D stuff there. Uh, and they had lead figures, they had all kinds of stuff, and then they had this like dark room off to the side that had like arcade games and a couple pinball machines. And I'd play arcade games, but the Black Knight would just sit there and go, ha, 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 you know, I, I dare you, or whatever it says. It would just talk so much smack, and I was like, I have to play this game. And I lost terribly, and I suck another quarter in, and lost terribly, and it talked smack to me, and I was like, I gotta kick its butt. So I played that game a ton, so when I finally bought one of those, that became like my first keeper game. So one of the things we talked about earlier was um, advice. Um, and listening to you say that, one of the things that um, I was remembering, when we got our first arcade machine that was converted into a, a MAME emulator, um, we were keeping it at my husband's office. Um, and when he left that job, we had to move it into our apartment, which was a three floor walk up. And then when we moved out of it, we needed moved out of the apartment, we needed to move it down three floors. Um, they're really heavy. Um, if you haven't moved a machine around, um, do not underestimate how much effort that's going to be. So you want to plan that out. When I was saying we we're looking for friends that have homes that have easy entry, we are looking for something you can just roll in on the main level, no stairs, <laughs> no um, limited carpeting, um, no like narrow doorways. Those things can all be really detrimental to you know your enjoyment of your game if you don't have somewhere that you can keep it and that and somewhere that um, has easy access. Yeah, that's a, actually a great point. I remember the first time I bought a giant Nintendo versus cabinet, and I saw one in here where it's got angled two things, uh, yeah. two full monitors. The depth of it. I hadn't planned for, and I went to roll it in my basement door, and it would not fit, and I could not get it in. So it was in my garage for a month or two, and then I ended up selling it. Um, I I plan it's buying. Disappointing. Yes, I plan buying cars and buying houses based on can I fit my games in here easily? And I, my current house, I have to take them down to the basement, and it's it's a huge pain. I finally bought an Escalera climber, which is its own. Uh, it's hard to figure out how to use that correctly. Uh, no, no, no pinball elevator? No pinball elevator. I guess that's next on the agenda. <laughs> I, I would add to what you're saying about moving games. If you don't have pinballs and plan to get them. They are heavy. Some of the new ones are really heavy. But when I was in a condo in Bellevue when I got into this, and actually the voice of the show, Byron Rains, who's working at the prize desk, he will tell the story of helping move a game up my condo steps, which had a U-turn. And he said at one point there was a balance loss, and he, his whole weight of his body went against the rail of those stairs. And he said he felt his whole life flash before his eyes and he visualized this machine coming down on him going down with the rail breaking and uh, I've thought about this to today to this day about that moment that Byron was trying to help me and 
he might have, you know, gotten hurt bad. And just from a, you know, stairs are hard to deal with when it comes to pinball machines. So be very careful. Uh, and yeah, after that, I moved to a house and I, just like you said, I found a basement, no stairs. <laughs> yeah, my old house, it just wasn't feasible. And when Dan and I bought that game, he actually hung on to it for me in his garage for a couple of months until I moved into my current house. Space is a thing. Which you bought for your pinball machines? Uh, being able to have them in the house or the garage was a condition of satisfaction for that house. Although I didn't put it that way to <laughs> Heather. <laughs> I need some workspace. Um, I think we should probably open up the mic to questions if people have questions about collecting uh, or, or have comments about their first game or any advice they want to share. There's a mic over there, and we have some prizes for the first couple of people that ask questions, too. How many of you have we scared off? <laughs> wow. Well, first, I have a sort of comment request. Um, it'd be awesome if next year you could get a, I don't know if you can actually call up the people at a spooky pinball, but it'd be awesome if next year you could get the Halloween pinball, ga Halloween pinball game to play. I've been dying to play because it, it just looks so beautiful and so cool. And I was at an X level arcade who has a booth here for the first time recently and they have an awesome collection but and they they do have it but unfortunately they didn't have it out to play which was a bummer because and they were charging a dollar but from the pictures and videos i've seen online of it i would gladly pay a dollar just to get some pictures of that elusive creature and finally play it and that's one i don't have the thousands of dollars to buy it right now but we did try to get a, a Halloween. Um, the Icebox has one, and I was trying to talk them into bringing it here, but couldn't manage it. Did you play the spooky Ultraman? There's Not an, yet. There's an Ultraman out there. And it, well, I hope you can get it. It's a very next, similar game. I hope you can get it next year yeah. or something. Yeah, I'm, I don't know when I'll be able to actually go to Olympia, but if I go there or I... I well, it, well, if you're in Seattle, the Icebox has it. Yeah, I... Might try and go to one of those two places to play it, but I just don't know when I'll actually be able to. It might. I would like to ask real quick of the audience. I would love to see a show of hands of how many of you have never owned a pinball or arcade machine yet. Good. And then I assume the rest of you have some. Also, it'd be awesome. <laughs> Oops. Be cool if next year you had some kind of co costume contest. I know this convention isn't as much about costumes, because I went to it in 2019 and only saw a few, but it'd be cool, too, just to see maybe some pack bands or doggy gods walking around with something. But my actual, I have two actual questions. Um, one is, is there any franchise or property, whether it's movie, TV, book, animation, whatever, that you would want to see as a pinball or arcade game, like for me, too? is uh, I would love to see Phantasm because it's like one of my favorite horror movie franchises along with Halloween and spoiler alert, all five, oops, all five movies have pinballs in it already that flow around, float around and kill people. And then uh, the other one I would love to see is Hellraiser on a couple of the movies or individual ones. And then my third is I've been noticed there's companies that are kind of um, specializing in more smaller home arcade games like Arcade 1-Up. I was curious if any of you have experience with Arcade 1-Up games and if you think they're worth it even though they're not quite the same size or as authentic as having like a, as a random example having like a copy of the Atari Star Wars 80s arcade game. So I think that's what right. Arcade 1-Up does. I think the 1-Ups are a good entry point um, for 
those of us that have full-size arcade games, uh, I, I think we find the controls are not very good, the monitors are a little small, the buttons are pretty weak. Um, I know arcade collectors that have bought them and then basically ripped apart the control panel and put in real uh, joysticks and real buttons and stuff. Uh, for dream themes, I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. That was local. Uh, I've talked to the fast guys about maybe doing one, but it's a lot of commitment into uh, building your own pinball machine. Well, I'm just was asking because I'm curious if the remaining three on the panel have just any random property yeah. they're a big fan. How about everyone else? I am a big, huge live music fan, and I would like to homebrew my own game where you could have a bunch of different bands that you could choose from and it would play their songs and have, have their artwork change in. Um, and having started a nonprofit, I have I barely have time to fix my games, much less play them, much less build one. So that's on the back burner for now. I spent so much time hoping they'd make Tron into a pinball machine, and then they did. So. That was kind of the one I always thought would make a good machine, and it's been done. Yeah, I'm not creative enough to think of my own. So I'm just super happy to see the new games that come out and find one that I like um, and learn all the rules and play it. So. Thanks. I'm hoping the next, uh, I'm hoping the next prize is like a Cactus Canyon. <laughs> Pinball machine. Me too. Can I yeah. get in line? <laughs> so uh, my question is, uh, when you're going out looking for machines and you find one on some forum like uh, Facebook or, or uh, Craigslist or something like that, w w what is the criteria by which you say, yes, this is a machine that I would be happy to purchase? And so what's... What, what is the point at which you say, yeah, this is a machine I would want, and what's the point at which you say, I'm going to pass on this one? Is it for sale? <laughs> for me, it, I'm not scared of electrical or mechanical problems now. So with a pinball machine especially, it's that the play field's in good shape. Um, or the price point. So it can be a little broken in if the price point's low enough. Those deals you have to snap up quick, though, because all these people are pretty rabid and jump on the deals. Yeah, definitely a lot of work to repair a play field. Um, and the artwork on, on play fields, unless you can get an, like a, re, a remanufactured play field, they can be um, just a ton of really tiny... Um, little touch-ups, and then you need to clear coat it. Um, so you kind of need to find somewhere to do that. Not everybody has, you know, access to those types of things. So those would be th that would be something that would um, that would scare me off if I hadn't done it before. Um, it's price point a lot of times, but also um, we do have a list of of games, and if. If there's something that pops up that's on our list and we've been looking for it for a while, we'll definitely entertain it. That playfield swap, even if you can find the new playfield, is no joke. I know. That's a lot of effort. I mean, I know Dan has a replacement playfield for one of his games, and he's been telling me he's going to do it for years. I have never done a playfield swap, and I have replacement playfields that I've bought over the last decade for three games. All right. Wow. It's intimidating. Um, for me, it's a combination of how much do I like the game and what's the price point. Um, I, know, I, I guess when I listened to your question, it just made me think of a, another story of my experience. When it comes to getting a game, there was a guy advertising a Lord of the Rings uh, through Craigslist, and I'd heard through a couple people that he was a big collector. And sometimes your audience and the type of person depends on how it goes. And I was really interested, and I thought, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to have the cash with me so I can make an offer with cash, because I think cash says a lot. It means kind of no crap. I mean, you've got the money right here. There's no talk about anything besides that. But he, 
he said an interesting thing to me. He said, I had so many people write me and wanted pictures of this game because people like to look at pictures because they don't want to make the effort to come out and look at it for real, which I think you should do. But he said, he said, I just kept telling people, just come and look at it. He said, no one wanted to make the effort. He said, and so here you are. And uh, he accepted my offer. And I feel really lucky I got that game because there were a lot of people interested, but nobody wanted to go out there and just look at it. And so, and some people, they'll send pictures, but um, every, every seller's different. And so, but the one thing I've just learned is that if you really want a game and you feel pretty confident, go and look at it and have the cash with you so you can make an offer. And I offered a couple hundred bucks less than what he was asking, but I had an envelope, I held it up, it was right there. And he was totally fine with it. So it was a win-win for all of us. So that's just one of my experiences. Hey, I'm, this question's for three of you up there. Have you had any regrets in selling a machine since one of you hasn't sold one yet? Um, I regret selling Doctor Who, but I bought it because my family are all huge Doctor Who fans, and I thought it would be great to have a machine that they could make, say, exterminate at will. And it's a tough game. And it, they didn't vibe with it, and so, uh, so that's why I sold it. But... I love that game. This is going to be really weird, but like your Adam's family, my regret is Doctor Who. Uh, I loved my Doctor Who. It was in great shape. It's out here now owned by Todd Clark. Uh, you can play it. Um, but Todd was really into it, and it was at a time where my dog needed new knees, and it was expensive, and I had to sell a couple games. Um, but I definitely regret it. Oh, I feel weird. I have no regrets. I, a lot of my games going out the door allowed a new game to come in the door. And so I, I, those games I had that have gone, they were great. And... I know a lot, of, a lot of them, I can find a way to play them, either at a friend's house or even virtually. Uh, I have a virtual pin, and yeah, it may not be the same as a real pin, but I can get a fix with just the sounds, hearing the sounds I remember, things like that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Uh, would you go for a older machine with just uh, like the first row out here is your first one, classic machine, pre EMs? One of those first, rather than uh, 2000 or later. Would you say 1970s as a first time owner or 2000 or so sooner? So the, old, the older games are EMs or electric, electromechanical. Um, and they stopped making them in the late 70s. I would not go for an electromechanical. Um, for me personally, it's, it's much harder to repair and they seem to have a lot more problems. Um, and if you buy one, you really need to go through the whole game, clean all the contacts, um, and get it running well. There are a decent amount of them though that cost less. Yes, they definitely cost less. I'm a little bit afraid of those games, um, mostly because the ones uh, that, that we have uh, function completely differently. Uh, so I'm a lot more comfortable with the more modern games. Our games are all 90s or later. I received the advice to buy an EM first. Uh, they are cheaper. I mean, if you look, you look up there. There are EMs that are. There's one up there for less than a thousand. You can certainly find plenty for less than two thousand, and they are mechanical. So if you are mechanical and and you want to look at what's going on, that's a good way to go. What I've heard about doing EM maintenance is usually if you have an emery board, you can go and you can clean everything up, and stuff will start working that wasn't working before. Um, I don't find them particularly interesting to play. They don't hold my attention for very long. What my advice is, buy a game that, that works and buy a game that you love. 
Um, when something goes wrong, you're going to be that much more motivated to fix it or to find somebody that can help you fix it. And so I'm the right age to have System 11, Williams, Bally, you know, mid-80s, late-80s be, like, when I got the bug. And those, are a, those for me, are a really nice uh, combination of simple and, um, and interesting. So, I mean, F-14 Tomcat was my first game. You look at that, the circuit boards on it are not rocket science. Whereas you look at the circuit boards on a modern Stern, you have no idea what's going on. When something, it's not like, hey, replace this transistor, it's buy a new board. So, find something you love, and you know, earlier is better to some degree. No heckling. I've got a question for the lady in the orange shirt. I want to know more about this Metallica you're planning on selling. <laughs> like to know oh, snap. details about that. No, um, so that's my wife, Sandy. Um, I'm involved in the community as well, but I am curious. I remember when I first got involved, um, feeling a lot of frustration around like, how do you find games? And even if you find a game, like you've got this list of games that you want, how do you know whether or not what they're asking is reasonable? Is this a good price? Um, we talked a little bit about like areas that you like places you go to look for games, which was about the same answer that I got back then. But but the other component to that is okay, I found something, I know that I want it. Is this a reasonable price? Like, what do you? How do you gauge that? Especially with pinflation, like every year they're just going up. I don't know, Armand. The price not be might not be reasonable. I mean, it's, it's once again, it's the buy low, sell high, you know, and everybody's trying to see if they can maybe make a little money off the sale. Not that they're this profitable business, but you're just trying to see if you can maybe increase what you have to put into your next pin. And then with pinflation, that's also another thing. But um, what I would always say is emotion is always going to come into play in your decision. And... I've definitely made emotional decisions on something I really want, and someone I knew had it, and I, it probably wasn't as perfect or minty as I would have liked, but I went ahead and got it because I really wanted it. And then I remember I did that with one pin, and I think two weeks later, a better one came on the market for the same price, and I, I thought to myself, I have only myself to blame, and I will just accept my decision, and I'm not going to get bent out of shape over it. But, um, you know, emotions prices, uh, the market. Um, but the, the thing I would say maybe work on the hardest is just patience. Um, you know, because that might help you feel better about what you end up getting and what you paid for it. And I'm kind of a broken record about the network and the community. And, you know, you're looking at that first game, you're looking at that fifth game. There are plenty of people around that'll have an opinion that can guide you in the right direction, and most of them are really happy to help people who are just coming into the hobby. There are, are some online price guides. You can look at Pinside. Um, it tends to be low because the market has taken off so much lately, um, and they only track sales that happen within Pinside. Um, there's the Boston Pinball Guide. It tracks eBay prices. Um, and then there's a printed pinball price guide that comes out. Uh, for arcade games, there's Evil Exodies price guide, which is a pretty good one. But again, the price, the, the prices are going up. Uh, and it all depends on condition on how things are priced because you'll see games priced too high that just are not the kind of condition that they should be for the price that they're asking. So, but there's, there's not a concrete way to determine a price, unfortunately. So show of hands up there, how many of you guys uh, purchased a game out of state, sight unseen, or just from pictures from an auction house or anything like that? Okay, and when the game arrived, uh, did you ever have a situation where it was misrepresented or the pictures didn't show the flaws in it? And if you did, what kind of reviews or did you leave a review for those, the place that um, misrepresented the game that you paid all the money for? I think it's really hard to get a good 
representation out of pictures. Um, and, and something that I might think is like a, a really big flaw might not be a flaw that the person that's trying to sell, sell it thinks is the same flaw or equally as important. So I think that that's an important thing to remember. Um, for, uh, let for, me, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it's not only just in the pictures, it's in the, the description too. The description. I mean, works great, you know, good condition. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's more than just the photos, it's the description that they've led you to believe what this game is all about or consists of. So for us, um, I'm, I'm thinking about the games that came in on containers. They don't really make representations about the quality. And you're looking at pictures and you're trying to assess whether or not it's good enough. Yeah, I mean, on those container games, we get three sentences, and English is not the guy's first language. Um, so those those came at a at a discount. We knew we knew they'd be dirty. We knew that they would have flaws. We knew what we were getting. So, yeah, you look at a picture, you do your best, and I don't think that exactly goes directly to your question. I think you're talking more about somebody online or somebody here in the states, out of state that. Yeah, it was here. It was here locally. I mean, you know, just putting it out there. The, the banning sale, um, the company that sold <clears throat> or handled that auction, um, and it wasn't just me. It was other people that had bought games from them. Completely misrepresented, and it wasn't just the photos. It was also also the description of the game. Um, I didn't participate in that auction. And I, I really don't want to be gossiping, but what I will say is that among the collectors I know, they don't have a whole lot of regard for that company, and they think that they're skeezy. And I, I guess, like, with the shipping container games, I bought games in auctions before. I just assume that they're not going to... They're going to hide the flaws. They're going to... In the photos. Um, and they're going to upsell anything. It's a little harder when it, you, it happens from an individual that you buy it. But for an auction, I, I, I just assume. But would you leave a bad review? Because, you know, it, as, as will getting, it matter? Into, getting into the collectibles, you know, I mean, pin side, everybody's, it's like eBay, right? I mean, you really want to work to build a relationship with whoever you're buying or selling and work to get that good review. So to me, that, you know, that does have an effect. And I'm just wondering... If you did buy a game from one of those companies, uh, would you or would you not leave a bad review? I probably wouldn't leave a review online, but I certainly would share my experience with my friends. Okay. Thank you. We have about a five, ten more minutes, so any other questions? Hi, I'd like to ask a question purely for entertainment value. Um, my dad is a collector, so I have tagged along with him for a lot of his buys, and I feel like you run into a lot of really interesting and cool people. So I'm kind of curious. I, I mean that, genuinely. I feel like you're giving me a look over there, but like I, in all sincerity. Um, do you have any particularly interesting stories about times you've bought a game or looked at a game or people that you've met? Because I just feel like it's a collection hobby where you end up with a lot of stories. I, I can't speak to buying games, but I've been on the transportation crew of the show for a long time. And when I started volunteering at the show, it was in a truck. And I got to go to people's houses. And I got to see the ones that are meticulous and have 50 games and they're spotless. And then I got to see the people that had a garage that was overflowing. And... I said, I, I, I'm never going to buy more games than I have space for. Her eyes are not rolling. But I did that. I, I saw a great deal and like, oh, this is, this is $1,200. Okay. Um, and I've loved meeting the people. So you're saying you meet some interesting characters. I mean... I, I get to be in these people's homes. I get to meet them. I get to hear their stories. I get to meet the guy who's in his 60s, 70s, and he has all these pristine EMs, and he loves them. Um, so I don't have, like, 
funny stories, but that was that's what has me laugh. And and again, broken record community. That's what I love about it. And I almost tried to get my daughter on this panel because she's roughly your age and is going to inherit all my stuff at some point. <laughs> I think she's counting on it. Thanks, Dad. All these giant games. <laughs> you know, the story I would tell about this to you is that there's the stories of just getting a pin or, or, you know, the experience of it being something you really wanted or you feel like it was a great deal. But, you know, one of my favorite memories is um, my Elvis, one of the games to go. Uh, I decided to put it up for sale on Pinside, and actually a local guy contacted me, and he asked if he would trade it, if I would trade it straight up for a Rip Ripley's Believe It or Not. And I didn't know a lot about that game. I talked to one of my friends. I said, what do you think? He said, oh, take that trade. He said, Ripley's is a really undervalued, awesome game. And so, so I said, okay. And he brought it up, and he took my Elvis, and he explained to me he's a super nice guy. And he said, actually, he said, this Elvis isn't for me. It's for my dad. He said, because my dad really wants an Elvis, and so I'm doing a three-way trade with my dad. I, he's, my dad's getting me this other pin. I'm getting dad the Elvis, and I'm parting with my Ripley's. He said, but this Ripley's, he says, this came from someone's home in California that the person never played it. He said it was my, my girlfriend and I's first pin. She put that, this neat little penguin on there that she made on the penguin ramp. And he told me the story, and I was very touched. And so I kept it for a couple years. And then I actually contacted him and asked him if he'd like to just buy it back. And I said, same price. I said, no, you know, I, I, I think a lot about how this you talked about how much this meant to you. And he said, I would love to buy it back. I can't get the money for six months. Would you wait? And I said, I'll wait. And I did. And then he came up and he was so happy. I mean, it was thrilled and it made me feel good. So there's also just the great stories of where you meet somebody, you hear a story about what this pin meant to them. And then you're kind of a part of even kind of giving it back to them so they can continue that story. And so that's, that's a good memory I have. So. I, uh, I've had a couple really weird game deals, but mostly they've been fantastic. Um, and one of the great things about it is the people you meet and you end up sitting there talking. Like, I will not bring my girlfriend on game deals with me because I end up talking to the person for like an hour while she's sitting in the car and she doesn't want to do that ever again, I don't think. Um, but because we start talking about who we also know that collect games or the history of how they got that game, it's great. I mean, that's how I met your dad. And I'm, your dad and I, I don't even know who sold us, who sold a game to each other first 20 years ago. But we, it was back when there weren't near as many collectors, so we all networked, and he would like text me and go, hey, there's a great deal on a game I saw on Craigslist up in Seattle. You should get it. And I did the same thing when there was one down by Olympia. Um, and we traded games, sold games back and forth. We always have a good time talking when we see each other. I hope he's coming this weekend. Um, right on. Um, and I've met a lot of the people that helped do the show through game deals. Um, Chris Walsh, who was one of our founders, who passed away um, during the pandemic. The first time I met him, he came over to my house to buy a pinball machine. And if you met Chris Walsh before, he will talk your ear off. And he had a big belly laugh, and he told me stories. Like two, year, two hours later, we're still standing in my yard talking. And... Sure enough, when the show started, he was like, you got to get involved in this. It's like, and he just, he just contacted everyone that he'd done game deals with. And that was kind of the foundation for starting the show. I would say the greatest thing about pinball collecting for me is that I'm sitting right here in a part of this. Because if I hadn't got into it, you know, I wouldn't have met all these cool people. So, um... The, there's something great about getting into uh, game collecting. I just think games are fun. You know, they make people happy. And it's great to meet people and share the, those moments with. And, uh, you know, look at this show. I mean, this show was started by a bunch of collectors who just love pinball and wanted to try to do something amazing. 
and here we are in our 13th year. It's mind-blowing, to be honest. We are about out of time, so we'd like to thank you for attending our panel, and feel free to talk to any of us one-on-one -on -one after. And have a good show. Play some games. Thanks, everyone.